All right, well, we will get started now at uh, 1035, a little bit of extra time for those watching the World Cup or something like that. Who knows? It's to that time of gathering, I guess, from across the world to uh, get together for important conversations. My name is Andy Nesting, and I'm the president of the Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies and a professor here at the University of Washington in the Department of Scandinavian Studies. And I am super excited to introduce this uh, book talk uh, today which carries on the conversations from our uh, annual meeting uh, last spring in Puerto Rico uh, that was such a success and I felt feel really uh, energized the field and uh, pushed us as a as a as a field in a in an important direction so uh, it's great to continue that conversation uh, this morning um, the SAS fall 2022 book talk with uh, Tammy Navarro about her book, Virgin Capital, Race, Gender, and Financialization in the U.S. Virgin Islands, was organized um, by Kimberly Lopalm, the executive director of the uh, Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies, as well as Lena Lee Ross, who is uh, assistant professor of Scandinavian Studies at the University of Washington, or rather, uh, Wisconsin, Madison. So thank you, um, Lena Lee, and thank you, Kimberly, for all the work you did to put this together. Let me introduce our two uh, speakers today. Um, um, however, before I do that, just let me remind you that um, the call for papers for our annual meeting in uh, that will be in Austin, Texas this year is now open. Uh, so if you are new to SAS, we encourage you to uh, propose a paper or perhaps put together a panel for the meeting. Uh, and um, you can find that information at ScandinavianStudy.org. Um, also, please consider joining the, our uh, association. It's a, more than 100 years old and advances Scandinavian studies in North America and a very energetic uh, group. And we're looking to continue that with our with our uh, conversations as well as with our journal Scandinavian, Scandinavian Studies. And um, we encourage you to consider submitting your work there. Today, this discussion will be moderated by Daniel Augusti, uh, Augustino. Uh, who is a assistant professor at the School of Communication and Culture at Aarhus University in Denmark. Her work is situated in the fields of visual culture, post-colonial studies, artistic research, and curating. She's working on a book project entitled Archival Encounters, Care, Curation, and Colonial Archives, focused on how artists rec reckon with and reimagine the archives of Danish colonialism. She's co-editor of various books, most recently, Uncertain Archives, Critical Keywords for Big Data, uh, MIT 2021, and War Archives, Archival Imaginaries, War and Contemporary Art, uh, 2020. At Aarhus University, she's co-coordinator of the research unit Postcolonial Entanglements, together with Lilan Kerber, Ushma Chowan Jacobson, and De Diana Gonzalez Martin. Uh, and then today, the our sort of principal is Assistant Professor of Pan African Studies at Drew University, Tammy Navarro. She's a cultural anthropologist whose work has whose work has been published in Cultural Anthropology, American Anthropologist, Transforming Anthropology, Small Acts Salon, The Caribbean Writer, Social Text, and Feminist Anthropology. She's also founding a founding member of the Virgin Island Studies Collective, BISCO, and a member of the editorial board for the journal Small Acts, a Caribbean, Caribbean Journal of Criticism. Dr. Navarro is co-host of the podcast, Writing Home, <clears throat> American Voices from the Caribbean, and the co-director of the Transnational Black Feminisms Working Group at Columbia University. She's the author of Virgin Capital, Race, Gender, and Financialization in the U.S. Virgin Islands, SUNY Press 2021, which has been recognized by the Associ Association for Feminist Anthropology and the Society for Latin American and Caribbean Anthropology. Uh, so let me turn the floor over to uh, Professor uh, Augustino and Professor Navarro, and uh, welcome everyone and uh, enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you everyone for making time and space across, we were talking just before we came on across various life ways and time zones and, and weatherscapes. So um, thank you. Uh, it's such a, a thrill to be gathered here virtually with you all. Some of you um, whose names I recognize from the little Zoom pop-ups um, and others of you I look forward to um, being in conversation with. Uh, so I'm Tammy Navarro, as, as you know, and I'll just give you a sort of sense of the shape um, of, of the time I hope we, we can spend together, which is I'm going to spend a few minutes just briefly introducing the book, book project, read a brief excerpt, um, and then we'll be in moderated conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. 
Um, so how the book came about and perhaps what the book is, uh, as, as Andy mentioned, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. And what he didn't mention and what's not in my bio is that I'm also a Virgin Islander. Um, really crucially to my work as an anthropologist are these questions of belonging and identity um, and even sort of native in relation to reflexivity of, of the sort of discipline of anthropology. Um, so for me, doing the fieldwork for this project was really a homegoing and a kind of um, threading that needle between homegoing and anthropological fieldwork, right? Um, I say all that to say that this project came about in a sort of curious way um, when I had gone back to the Virgin Islands and was sort of casting about trying to figure out what to do with my life many years ago um, when I finished my undergraduate degree. And my friends who would ultimately beca become my informants kept bringing up this EDC, EDC, this acronym. I had no idea what it was. Um, and what it turned out to be is the basis of, of the book, which I'm about to read an excerpt from, um, the Economic Development Commission. Um, and what that was in the early 2000s was really an attempt by the local government of the US Virgin Islands um, to create an offshore financial sector. So this isn't unusual for the region. The Cayman Islands has a, a really robust um, offshore banking sec sector. They're perhaps most famous for it, but so does the neighboring British Virgin Islands. Um, and so I thought, okay, if this is what people are talking about on the ground um, in such complicated ways, I better look into it. What became clear as I did the nearly two years of field work um, was a really intense interrelationship between the history of coloniality um, surprisingly enough to me, even the sort of Danish presence, right? Thinking about the these islands are known as the US Virgin Islands now purchased uh, by the United States. Um, but even the history, the sort of um, built environment, the architecture, the street names, right? All remain in Danish um, in the US Virgin Islands. So thinking about the kind of historicity um, of the former Danish West Indies, now USVI, in relation to something that was being presented at least as an extremely sort of, um, novel, uh, radical break with everything that had come before uh, development initiative, right? It was presented as a kind of paradigmatic shift, right? So we've had all these problematic um, attempts at development, clearly enslavement and plantation agriculture had its failings, industrialization, right? All this sort of, I walked through the periodization um, of economic well-being in these islands, right? From predating the period of, of Danish occupation, but through the Danish occupation through uh, up, up to the present US um, moment of coloniality. And it became clear to me, as I think we'll talk about in the conversation, that for those living um, in the US Virgin Islands, there was a real intense interplay between what we often think about as past and think about as present, right? And so I um, have come up with this sort of rubric of spectral time <clears throat> as a way to get at both the complicated sense of temporality, and a lot of Caribbeanists have written about this, um, a complicated set of set, sense of time in which there isn't a past, present, future, but rather multiple past, present, futures that are deeply imbricated with, with one another. Um, but also, as I think we'll talk about this notion of not just complicated time, but haunted time, right? Because for so many in the Virgin Islands, this seemingly novel, exciting offshore banking sector, how they received that, which was so unnerving um, to advocates of, of the development initiative, um, lo many local people on the ground received it as an attempt to re-enslave the island. Makes no sense. On the face of it, madness, right? Um, and so the project really became one of translation and an attempt to sort of articulate both positions, um, both positions which are in tension with one another, right? But articulate them across this seeming divide, right? No, people aren't crazy, or it's not a misapprehension um, of the program to say this is slavery reincarnate, but rather it's a different engagement with time, with capital, with racial capitalism, right? Cedric Robinson's notion of, Cedric, uh, of racial capitalism in particular, right? So how does making money and increasing the wealth for already wealthy financiers on the backs of racial hierarchies, how does that feel? How does that resonate? What does that look like in the lived experience for Virgin Islanders? Um, and that's so much of what the ethnographic project became, right? Again, thinking through the seemingly long ago colonial history of these spaces um, and how for so many living in the Virgin Islands, it wasn't that long ago at all. And in fact, something that seems so novel and is presented as a sort of paradigmatic shift is in fact um, placed anyway in, in the kind of long history and the long durée um, of capitalist development in the Caribbean, right? Which by the way, we have seen both licit and illicit sometimes at that border, which is um, what I argue the EDC is, a sort of bleeding edge of um, licit and illicit, right? We've seen um, piracy, plundering, privateering under company rule. We've seen the sort of 
complex array um, of the ways that colonial power I and mean, capitalist accumulation has worked. I and mean, what Virgin Islanders want to do is continue to understand this current moment of um, financialization as in that is in that vein as part of that long history. I mean, what a number of the advocates of this seemingly new program wanted to do was really sort of um, propose that it was divorced, it was discreet from all that had come before, right? We understand those shortcomings, that happened, let's get on with it. Um, and for many who were trying to live their lives and found their lives disrupted in, in unexpected, complicated ways, um, that simply wasn't possible. Um, so that I think will serve as a kind of introduction to what I what I want to read and hopefully will explain um, the kind of temporality of the, this brief section that I'm reading from. I'm going to read just a page um, from a chapter that I've entitled Spectral Time. This is a chapter in which I really try to present and grapple with this notion um, of racial capitalism, right? So what did Cedric Robinson mean? What is the deep interconnection and imbrication of race, racism, um, and capital accumulation? And also, what does that have to do with the sort of very complicated history of these islands, um, formerly Danish West Indies, now the US Virgin Islands, also owned by, five, in addition to those, five other colonial powers, right? It's changed hands seven, seven times um, in, its, in its history, right? These islands have. So I'm gonna read briefly just about some of that colonial history, and then hopefully in the conversation, it will become clear how this, again, this seemingly um, discreet long ago time, how it continues to inform something like a novel economic program in the region today. All right, so this is from Spectral Time. The production of sugar through plantation agriculture was a particularly lucrative endeavor, and there was much interest on the part of European powers in entering this market. Of the countries that participated in the trading of slaves and plantation agriculture in the Caribbean, the most numerically significant were the British, Dutch, French, and Spanish. The Danes entered these markets rather late and on a much smaller scale. The Danish empire, consisting primarily of St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, has been described as, quote, Lilliputian, end quote. Beyond the small scale of these holdings, their very value to Denmark was in question. Early St. Croix governor uh, Jens Hansen pointed to the inadequacy of the company directors he was given, noting that he had access to, quote, 20 living men, one of whom is 60 years old, and the others such drunkards that they are hardly able to stand, much less post the watch, end quote. As Denmark's colonial ambitions were not as far reaching as those of its peers, its role in the history of slavery and colonization has long been understudied. Nevertheless, the dehumanizing conditions faced by enslaved persons bound for Danish territories were the same as those found on slave ships traveling under other European flags. The passage from the African continent to these islands was incredibly arduous, with enslaved Africans regularly dying during the Middle Passage from the continent to the Americas, with living and dead remaining shackled together. Upon arrival in the Danish West Indies, slaves were purchased and distributed among the island's plantations to cultivate crops, primarily sugar and cotton. St. Croix featured hundreds of plantation estates with names such as Lagrange and La Grande Princess, units into which the island remains carved today. Work on the plantations was arduous with sugar being the chief crop cultivated in the fields. Slaves worked from sunup to sundown whether in good health or ill, and were miserably treated with beatings and mutilations featuring prominently under Danish rule. Limbs or entire bodies could be trapped in the grinding mills. The economic system of plantation slavery was made possible in the Caribbean as elsewhere across the new world by a worldview that centered whiteness as the culmination of humanity and conversely positioned black Africans as animal-like and subhuman. This racism shaped daily life on plantations in the Danish West Indies, with Black women being singled out for a particular brand of discursive abuse, being labeled promiscuous, hypersexual, deviant, a process of dehumanizing and what Hortense Spillers has called ungendering, used to justify the systemic rape of enslaved Black women. The particular sexual and physical violence to which Black women were subject demonstrates the ways in which both race and gender 
were central to the operation of slavery, right? So some of that is rehearsing well-known history, but thinking about the implications of race and gender, and I'll go on to argue in the book Color, as it relates to what we want to think in more contemporary lands as employment opportunities figures prominently into my argument in the book, right? So thinking through what was life like for enslaved Africans, particular, particularly Black women in this moment of enslavement, plantation, agriculture, traces very neatly, in fact, onto some of the experiences of um, employment possibility that are offered in this economic development, this EDC program, right? So that's just one kind of tendril, one instance that I want to offer that kind of makes legible the argument the Virgin Islanders are making, that it's not so different, right? That we're not in a sort of radically different moment. Of course, of course, right? It's not slavery reincarnate. That's not my argument at all, right? That's what the informants sort of experience it as. But my job, I felt was really to sort of translate that deeply felt anxiety, those racialized anxieties around wealth accumulation, um, racism, instances of exclusion, right? And tie it into the history of slavery to, if nothing else, um, to make sense of this kind of framing and present it as an alternate um, framing of time, of capital, um, and of possibilities of belonging in the Caribbean. So maybe that's enough of an overview. Um, and uh, Danielle, I believe has questions. Thank you so much, Tammy, for that uh, wonderful reading and overview of your book. Um, before we begin, I want to briefly thank our hosts at the Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Studies, Andy, Kimberly LaPalm, and Lena Lee Roos for facilitating this event across various time zones. I also want to uh, thank the Postcolonial Entanglements Research Unit at Aarhus University in Denmark, and particularly my co-coordinator who's here today, Lidan Kerber organizer of the last annual meeting of the society in Puerto Rico for planting the seeds for the event today. Thank you, Lil Ann. Um, and thanks to everyone in the audience for making time to join us today. It's very nice to see many familiar names across many time zones as well. Um, so as the moderator, I also want to mention that after this dialogue between Tammy and I, the audience members are welcome to post questions. Um, by unmuting themselves and posing their questions or by writing questions in the chat. I'm happy to read your questions aloud. And because the event is being recorded, if you don't feel comfortable unmuting yourselves, just write the questions in, in the chat and I'll be happy to read them for you. Um, and we're aiming to end our time together by 12 p.m. EST, and that would be 6 p.m. Central European time. So we still have plenty of time to engage in conversation. So now, Tammy, it was such a great pleasure to read uh, your book, and I'm so happy for this opportunity to engage in conversation about your work. Thank you. um, and many, I, there's many issues that I appreciated, but one of the things I really want to publicly commend you on is that your writing is so elegant and so clear and so pristine that it makes it really accessible for anyone who's not an anthropologist. I'm not an anthropologist, so it's it's really easy to enter your book, and it's so fascinating to um, just witness the many issues and layers that you're able to unpeel throughout the book. And that was just such a fascinating read. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. It was, I'll just say quickly, it was important to me that the book be available and accessible to the people that share their experiences with me. It really is on the, on the strength of their um, trust really in sharing their stories and hopes and experiences and, and, really theoretical framings that the book was made possible. And I have written extensively about this. It's no secret that I think um, the discipline of anthropology carries with it some sort of historical baggage around the way we publish our material and, and the relationship of our informants to the published work. So all that to say, thank you. I appreciate that and that's intentional that I, I recently returned from presenting this book in the Virgin Islands and it was well received there and um, accessibility is, as I understand it, a political um, commitment. Exactly, and that's that's so clear from reading your work. There's a political commitment in your writing, uh, and also in the way that you acknowledge um, the the theorization that comes from your informants. Right, that is not something that you're doing on your own, and, and I've also appreciated very much. So I have a series of questions that revolve around the many fascinating issues that the book brings to light. But since 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 you started there, perhaps we could begin with this notion of spectral time that you mobilize in your analysis and I know you borrowed the term from film scholar Bliss Quillim mm -hmm. uh, so to make sense of how 
for many crucians, the EDC program um, conjures up a past um, that resembles um, white domination in a model of slavery. And I know that many of us here today are artists, literary scholars, cultural scholars. So we are familiar with um, sort of the theorizations around haunting and ontological frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you say a bit more about how you studied hauntings ethnographically? You know, what constitutes for you evidence of haunting? That was for me something really uh, fascinating to read. Yeah, thank you. And what an interesting question. How do you ethnographically tra trace a ghost, right? Um, but of course, right, a lot of it comes from literary studies. You, you, mesh, you mentioned Ambrose um, Lamkua, um, but also Avery Gordon, of course, Anne Stoller, thinking about imperial debris. So I will say that the sort of um, emphasis on hauntology was a sort of secondary contribution. The first thing I realized in doing the work was I had to think about uh, complicated temporality. Everywhere I looked on the ground, that's what people were talking about and in the theorizations as well, right? So there's David Scott, there's um, Jackie Alexander on palimpsestic time. So in the Caribbean, there was clearly a sense of a sort of repetition, right? A sense of complication, as I say, of multiple pasts, presents, futures, plural. Um, so I understood that. That was sort of point A. But immediately following was a sense of it's not just multiple past, presents, and futures that are that are imbricated that are kind of constantly interacting with one another and impacting one another but there's also a deeply deeply racialized anxiety and that's how the hauntology came about right and so that how that happened was in moments where that could be read as as somewhat benign right so someone would say for instance a lot of my ethnographic work came as is the case with much anthropology came by, by way of gossip and sort of eavesdropping um speaking of the illicit illicit um but someone would say something like oh you know i heard that they're going to erect a gate, right, and sort of cordon off this section of the island, which is, by the way, illegal and, and logistically impossible. But it sprung up, right, and it spread like wildfire, and people sort of latched onto it, um, and it had a kind of legibility and believability, and I thought, well, that's so interesting, right, that's so interesting that it's like uh, lighting an easily lit fuse, right, there's already a sort of deep anxiety around, quote, unquote, these people, right, this sort of binary of us and them, they're up to something, right? We have seen these people, again, that binary that I work so hard to trouble in the book, we've seen these kinds of people, these kind of wealthy white capitalists increase their wealth by circuiting through the Caribbean before. We know this story, right? And look what they're up to now. And so those were the flashpoints that really served as the early moments of there is a haunting here, that the specter of slavery is never far removed, right? That any kind of misstep that was judged as a misstep by residents was read in the kind of register of, well, they're just, they're just trying to do it again, right? And that's why the framing is so important because without the framing, it's madness, right? Which is how it was received by advocates. It was a sort of constant search for the right data point, the right pie chart, if only we could explain it, right? In the right op-ed piece in the, in the local paper. Um, but without taking seriously this, this engagement with long time, um, and capitalism uh, projects uh, projects rooted in racial capitalism that have failed them for generations without taking that seriously as the grounding um, framework, it does make no sense, right? It is crazy to think, what do you care if we erect a gate? What do you care if we privatize a few beaches, right? But when it's read in this sort of long history um, of racialization, of slavery as the kind of um, signal event, right, in which all of this culminates, then that logic starts to emerge, right? And so that I think is what was lacking. And that's why I describe it as a kind of instance of translation, because if you don't take the whole thing seriously, you just see sort of spotty instances of madness. Um, and so it became um, important to me to take seriously things that would sort of easily be dismissed. So these instances of haunting. Um, and by the way, I should say that, you know, the Virgin Islands is a place that is deeply haunted by its past, right? And and the past is never really past. I write about in the book, um, in the Virgin Islands, all the street names in the major towns. So Christian Stead, Frederick Stead, still named after um, sovereigns, right? Uh, Scandinavian sovereigns, but also the streets are, are goddess. Um, there are great swaths of land that are um, covered in plantation ruins. The excerpt I just read um, from explains that the, the neighborhoods of, of the island of St. Croix, at least, are still divided um, into the same plantation uh, division plots that they were during the moment of slavery. It's not so past, right? If you have to walk down these goddess and see the seven flags that have colonized this space, you begin to wonder how past is the past, right? That sort of uh, the artist Levon Bell writes about this, a sort of lived experience, the built environment, right? That there is a kind of weight um, to that fraught um, 
complicated relationship between something that that we would like to think about as long ago but when you're walking it every day when you're passing it every day um it bleeds into the present very much and if it bleeds into the present then of course of course it has to shape how we might imagine any possible future i hope that answers your question yeah thank you i, th I think it's so interesting the way you you know how you approach haunting that it's 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 discursive in the way people describe how they perceive this financial service, but it's also deeply affective, but it's also something in the air that it's in the environment. And I find that very interesting the way you capture that. Yeah, and people, I mean, I should say it, it is, I came to it primarily in the discursive register, but there is a fear. People are afraid that it could erupt and it did in many, in, not many, in a number of instances into physical violence, right? There's a fear that there's something afoot, right? And it could sort of spring up. There's a famous, um, which I write about in the book, a famous sort of instance of, of race-based violence called Fountain Valley that happened in the 1970s on St. Croix. I'm um, on a wealthy golf course. It was owned by a member of the Rockefeller family at that time. Um, and some little, this is all up for debate even now. Um, there's a Netflix documentary on it if you are so inclined. Um, but a number of local residents allegedly um, uh, came on to the golf course and murdered in cold blood uh, a number of wealthy golfers many of whom were white, a handful of whom um, were also were black working at the resort, right? And so this this kind of invocation of um, the Gulf Coast was called Fountain Valley, this invocation of they, these EDC people, better be careful before Fountain Valley happens again, right? That was also a deep part of the haunting, that it had erupted. These kinds of racialized tensions had in, historically erupted into physical enacted violence. Um, and there was a kind of threat, always the specter looming of this could easily happen again, right, if they don't watch out. Um, and it just felt like a powder keg so often because none of the divisions were steady. It was unclear when we were crossing over from the discursive into the potentially material, right? Um, but it was it was very clear that front and center in the conversation for many Virgin Islanders was something that was so far removed from the minds of many advocates, right? And so I thought, well, we have to think about this as being haunted and only some people can apprehend the ghosts, right? It's just like a real haunting. And the people who don't see it think you are out of your mind. So um, I, it seemed like a useful framing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So another aspect that I was also um, impressed by is the way you navigate between highly contrasting views of these financial services, right? And at a certain point in the book, you talk about how you took seriously the concerns of your uh, Kushan informants um, and how you place these concerns in productive tension with the position of its advocates, right? Um, can you say a bit more about how you navigate it and how you handle this productive tension? Because you do it so mm. elegantly and almost seamlessly in the book, but I'm sure it must have been really hard to navigate, like, because it's, it could also, it's also kind of a question of allegiance, right? Where, what do you emphasize in your yeah. reading? Yeah, thank you. That's such a, a hard question. I don't want to veer too far into um, what I, I think will be a, a topic of our conversation, um, which is my positionality, right? Um, but I think that, that that exactly what you said when you said, think about, talk through the tensions, the first word that sprang to my mind was allegiance, even in the writing of it. Um, so without saying too much, I will just reiterate, I'm from the Virgin Islands. I knew a number of these people as friends and neighbors and just extended acquaintances before the period of formalized field work when they became informants. And that took a lot of work for me to kind of structure that difference. Um, but yeah, these are really different worldviews, right? Thinking about neoliberal development as the kind of salvation of a long struggling economy um, would be frustrating if you experience neoliberal development as a reiteration of a long failed project. That is on its face frustrating, right? Those two things are at odds and intention. I um, mean, I did in many ways feel myself as an embodiment of this sort of back and forth. Um, but again, it felt like a political project to me to at least make legible to both sides what was going on because so often I would hear the same refrains in both camps, which is bizarre, right? We just want a better life for Virgin Islanders. Everyone said this all the time. What did that mean, right? So we had to think through the, these tensions. First of all, who are Virgin Islanders? What does that even mean when you exist under a colonial flag, right? Virgin Islanders could well mean Americans, right? For the EDC advocates, that's exactly what it meant, right? Um, uh, Virgin Islanders hold American passports. So for them anyway, for advocates, someone from Texas or Florida had as much right to belong in the Virgin Islands as did someone who could trace their ancestry back generations, right? 
um, and better life. So first of all, who are Virgin Islanders and what is a better life, right? Is it more money? Is it more capital circuiting around, kind of <laughs> floating in the ether and benefiting some who were maybe already uh, relatively privileged? Maybe that's a better life, right? But it, it, it seemed to me that in the midst of all this tension, as you talk about, there needed to be a, pro a productivity to the tension. And, and the way I tried to go about that was to introduce nuance um, all across the board to say, well, it's not, right? It's not slavery. It feels like a sort of race, a deeply racialized project of wealth accumulation, sure. Um, but here are the differences right here are how it's not just a black and white story, because this could easily be told as a sort of David and Goliath story, right? Wealthy white people coming down and sort of um, wreaking havoc on poor black people. And that's the way it was represented, <laughs> to be fair, um, by a number of my informants, right? But that is the sort of rhetoric of it. But when you sit with people and interview them and talk about the lived experience, they'll say things like, well, that's not right. There's an enormous Puerto Rican population. There's a sort of descendants of indentured uh, workers. So there's an Indo population as well. Oh, right. There's also sort of Arab community, right? So, okay. So it's not just black and white and it's not necessarily slavery, but that is the specter, right? That's the sort of refrain. That's the reference point for something that feels like um, residential segregation, that feels like a sort of exclusivity in the name of wealth accumulation. Um, so I felt like, okay, these two people are, these two camps are completely at odds. But if you talk with people, and maybe this is the value of the ethnographic, you can actually inject some of the nuance of lived life, lived experience, right? Um, and on the other side, thinking about, well, these people are not complete idiots, right? Let's think about why someone would say um, this feels like slavery, why someone would be frustrated with your attempts to privatize um, beach access, which is legally ensconced um, as a right to all Virgin Islands residents, right? Th take seriously for a moment this framing, go with them, understand it at least if you don't. Um, say you don't take it up as your own, but at least try to understand the ways that they're making sense of your presence. Um, and then you have some hope of sort of navigating what felt like a deep chasm. Um, so I think that that's the sort of literary approach I took, just trying to get as much detail and nuance as I could, because when you talk to people, there's a real difference between the kind of bombastic refrain that they'll offer, right? This is terrible. This is the best thing. And these are the, these are direct quotes, by the way, this is the best thing that's ever happened to the Virgin Islands. You're an idiot if you don't, these would appear as headlines in the local paper. If you don't understand this, you need to leave. Um, or these people are out to get us, right? That these are sort of, it's impossible to be in conversation in those sorts of moments. But it's in quieter moments of participant observation where you're able to sort of get at some of the, what are you actually afraid of, right? What is the kind of quotidian experience? What happened to your kid's school, right? When did you feel displaced um, in that neighborhood? You felt surveilled in new ways. Okay, let's talk about that. So um, in some one conversation, for instance, someone was talking about thinking about neoliberalism, the privatization of security, right? So the police force on St. Croix is not uh, known for its efficacy, let's say. Um, and so in some of the more well-to-do neighborhoods where EDC people have taken to um, living, there's been private uh, security forces that have been created, right? And so um, local residents in some instances have talked about being, being and actually uh, feeling surveilled, right? Followed, marked, tracked in particular ways. Um, and so in taking seriously those kind of grounded examples of lived experience, I was able to tie that into the sort of broader rhetoric of this is amazing, this is terrible. Thank you. Um, and also just to connect back to, to what you already mentioned, I really enjoyed um, reading your reflections about your positioning as a researcher who's also a member um, of the community, um, which is of course very, complex to articulate. Can you say a bit more about that process of reflection and how you arrived at a position as both researcher and community member that made sense to you? Um, and also in connection to this, I would also love to hear more about the importance of autoethnography and particular Black feminist autoethnography in this context, which is also something that you write about. Yes. Thank you. Uh, when I find that happy balance, I will let you know. You know, I think in some ways I'm I'm still looking. I think anthropology as a discipline is still looking. I occupied a very particular place, as I say, I'm from there, and not only am I from there, but I I approach this um, with my political commitment sort of front and center. That you know, I knew these people. I knew that they weren't out of their minds, and I knew that they had seen things before, and their ancestors had experienced things, and through oral traditions, they had a different kind of set of knowledges, right, that um, these newly arrived Americans just simply didn't have access to and weren't frankly interested in. 
So I knew that and I knew it was important um, to take seriously. And at the same time, I felt that it was a slippery slope from taking that seriously to sort of becoming incorporated into what I write about as the we, right? The kind of us and them, the we versus them, which never made any sense anyway. But again, it's the rhetoric, right? And the lived experience that always uh, fell apart. But in these sort of flashpoints of violence that I talked about, for instance, in the invocation of Fountain Valley, there was always an us and a them, right? Um, and as an anthropologist, I felt I would put in place these sort of really just devices and, and thought experiments for myself. I was actually putting on my um, anthropologist hat. The anthropologist John Jackson um, writes about this. And so he, one of the things you have to do often is just reach out um, and do cold calls, right? You just have to call somebody and say, will you talk to me? I got your name and information from someone. Um, and he is a, a very shy person in his actual life, but in his anthropological self, he has to do these things. So he created a cartoon character called Anthro Man, right? Who was sort of um, not afraid of people, a very sort of extrovert. So I tried to embody maybe Anthro Woman and just feel like, okay, um, I have to take seriously my position as a Virgin Islander, but it's crucially important and I won't get any usable data if I'm always incorporated into the we, right? And so I had to put these um, exercises in place for myself and for my informants where they would say, well, you know how we are, you know what we like to do. And I had to constantly, constantly trouble that for them and say, well, no, explain it to me. I don't understand what you mean there, right? And in, walk, in having them walk it through and say, well, you know, when people from the US come down, I said, well, aren't, aren't you an American as well? But in, in articulating it for themselves, the complexity became more apparent, right? But I, I felt that it was not just a struggle to sort of push against the familiar, right? And to not be sort of embraced as a home goer, um, that was, that provided, and I don't want to minimize it, that provided invaluable, maybe backdoor is a way to think about it, access, right? That I had access to networks that were invaluable to me, but it was also, it presented a danger, one that could undermine the validity of my work, both within the discipline, right? So she just went home and talked to some folks um, and within the sort of circle of EDC advocates, right? So I encountered a lot of that. What are you actually up to? We know the Virgin Islanders aren't on the whole crazy about this program. Are you here to spy on us? Like what's what's really going on? So I felt that I was constantly being misread um, from both sides. And for myself, I knew that I wanted to create an anthropological text that had merit within the discipline, but that would also stand as a sort of tool of translation, right? That would make sense to these, these camps that were in tension. Um, and so I did a lot of things. So I would try to sort of, um, pick up the lineage of folks like Zora Neale Hurston, who is, uh, you know, you talked about autoethnography auto among Black feminist um, ethnographers. So Zora Neale Hurston, who famously, uh, you know, leaves Columbia University under the tutelage of, of Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology, Papa Franz, as she calls him, um, and returns home to her home in Florida, right, to collect what she calls Negro folktales. This is a huge decision for her, right? A very fraught decision. She does it anyway, takes it seriously, and it's um, tremendously important to the discipline of anthropology and the material that we have access to today. But she had to walk through that in a much earlier moment than I did, right? And think about who are these aunties and uncles and how are they receiving me? And how do I get, you know, she describes um, the discipline as having the spyglass of anthropology. How do you get that critical distance so that you both have access to those pre-existing net networks that you need right, you understand the dialect, you sort of, you understand the inside jokes, but also you are distant enough, right, that you can apprehend something new and something different um, and make it legible to a broader community. So that, that I think took a lot of work, some, some anthro man impersonation, but also thinking through folks like Hurston, but in the more contemporary moment um, about autoethnography, folks like um, Donna I.M. Davis and Krista Craven uh, have recently published a hugely important volume thinking about questions like rather than dismissing the personal experiences and subjectivities, plural, of Black women in the discipline, what if we took those seriously as data points, right? What if their multiple exclusions and histories and positionings were ways that we could think about our frameworks more complexly? So it's not just that they're telling their life stories that don't matter, but what if their life stories um, are important sort of um, stitches in the fabric of telling this larger story of whatever it is they're doing. For me, it was tracing economic development across these different colonial moments into the present. Um, but it was a way that enabled me, and I was called to, I should just, by way of telling the truth, I was, I should say, I was called to do this by my reviewers of the book. Um, the first version of the book I sent in didn't read, I wasn't nearly as present, right? My 
self, <laughs> my multiple selves weren't nearly as present. And the, re the reviewer said, we're hearing so much about the informants and it's clear that you're here somewhere that you have to be truthful. You have to be more forthcoming about your reflexivity, how you occupy this position. How did you get into these rooms, right? These rooms that are seemingly at odds. Um, and how did you occupy those rooms when you got there? So I had to think about, okay, it's my positioning as this particular kind of embodiment, right? I present in a particular way, which made me um, able to enter the, the sort of spaces of EDC advocates, right? It's my pre-existing connections in these other ways, right? So I had to sort of think those through for myself and articulate them for the book to become the book that it did, um, which was difficult. I didn't, I, you know, I was like, this is a story about the informants and these two people are not talking. Um, but as the mediator, as a kind of interlocutor, I had to really theorize my own position. Um, and it's really the, the courage and the, the, theorization of um, anthropologists that have come before me, particularly black women anthropologists um, that have said, this is where I'm from, this is what I'm doing, this is hard. Um, it's hard and it's important. Um, and that gave me the sort of ability to feel like, okay, it's hard and it's important to the story. Great, and uh, a shout out to book reviewers who uh, press us <laughs> on important matters like this. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is, um, somewhat connected to what you just said but i guess there's your your analysis of the gendered aspect or the gendered impact of the edc right and your chapter on this sort of this new figure of the edc girl mm -hmm. can you say a little bit more about that and because it seems to be that is that's also connected to uh, your own embodied navigation in the field right because you are able to take up uh, those uh, positions and I, think, I mean for those who haven't read the book I think it's your methodology is fascinating because you interned at several companies right and that's just if you could speak a little bit more about that yeah um thank you yeah un unwittingly interned I should say um so I went around and just said I want to interview all the people who work here can I talk to your employees and they said no they're working um but if you want to work as a serve as an unpaid intern and that sort of raised alarms for me of course methodologically like I don't work for you I, I may have I may likely have critical things to say about this whole operation um but that was clear from the outset and that's another instance of really um, tracing my position clearly, right? That I am a social scientist and I'm here to collect data. So I said, no, you can't just hang out all day and interview our workers, but if you want to be an unpaid intern, you know, we'll show you around, um, which didn't make sense to me at the time, because as I say, some people apprehended me with an air of suspicion, right? So we know Virgin Islanders are not crazy about this program. Are you here to spy on, on us? So that was one sort of end of the spectrum. The other was really looking at me as a tool, Right, thinking about, okay, this is a local person. If we can show her that, again, if we can show her the data set, the pie chart, if we can explain to her why this is a sort of salvific um, uh, approach to development, then she can explain it to the rest of them, right? So this will be our sort of key, right? If we can get this right kind of local, which is a phrase that came up often, um, we can explain it to her, then she'll go back and tell everyone else. So it was sort of this kind of um, dual response that I got. So their solution to sort of having me hang around was to have me be an unpaid intern. One of the companies that I interned with, I should say, is well, was called Stanford Financial, um, headed by a billionaire businessman who had recently fled uh, the country of Antigua um, and Barbuda um, and set up shop on St. Croix. And so that's a large part of the, the methodological uh, contribution of the book, thinking through my time at some of these EDC companies, the, the largest of which was Stanford. Um, just to give away the ending, I assume most people haven't read the book. Uh, he ended up being, as a number of EDC uh, companies have been, end up getting charged with fraud. Um, and he is in jail in the US, it's been some years now, but his initial sentence was 110 years um, for operating a Ponzi scheme, right? So it was a, ma a massive fraud, uh, which was some of the rumors, some of the haunting that had sort of trailed him from Antigua, but he was found out when he came under the American flag um, by entering the US territory of the US Virgin Islands. Um, so the figure of the EDC girl, right? So that's a sort of preamble. I was able to get to the figure of the EDC girl through this unusual, I would say, methodology of this unpaid internship. Um, and immediately, immediately upon entering these, these companies, it struck me that these women all had so much in common, right? First of all, I knew a number of them um, from these pre-existing networks of sort of um, particular schools and neighborhoods and right. So, and they all seem to know one another, right? Or a number of them seem to know one another um, from their sort of backgrounds of relative privilege. It's a small space. So this book is about the US Virgin Islands, but I did the bulk of the fieldwork on St. Croix, which is only 84 
um, square miles. So it's not an enormous place, right? Uh, but still, it was of note that a number of these women had very similar backgrounds. So they were generally in their 20s to early 30s, um, not yet married, childless. Um, they came from these backgrounds of relative privilege. They would be generally middle class or upper middle class. Um, and had gone to either private high schools. And then importantly, the majority of them seemed to have gone to college off island, right? So there was some sort of mainland experience um, that worked to maybe mitigate anything like a local accent, right? So they answered the phone, Stanford Financial or XYZ Financial. Um, they had a particular sort of clip to their voice. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting, right? This background of this EDC girl, these people seem to have a whole host of things in common. Um, so that was a sort of the sort of observational, the participant observation uh, contrib contribution. And then when you begin to read the literature on the feminization of labor across time, right? So the, ex the excerpt I read from the book is about the ways that race, color, and gender impacted work under slavery, right? How black women in particular were prized and reviled under slavery. Um, there's a similar thing going on with EDC girls, right? How is it that their race and color and gender, this package that I just explained, um, enables them to be taken up by this kind of transnational capital, this program. I mean, in what ways are they then sort of targeted for that, right? So one of the things I write about is the ways that local um, residents would often single out EDC girls and say things like, well, we know you have that EDC money, right? Not, we know you have your salary, but we, we know you have that sort of tainted money. And there's been a lot of anthropological work on, on money, right? So Zelizer has written on, you know, the sort of moral economy of capital and money in particular, some money being dirty money, right? Some money that you can't use for certain purposes. Um, and so this notion that local residents would say, well, we know you have that money that's somehow tainted because we don't trust this program. So because we don't trust this program and we know that those people are not reliably invested in the community, we're going to get it through you, right? So we're going to target you and say, why don't you come in here and spend this money? We're going to, you know, hit you up for um, a job. Say, here's my resume, get me in there or give me just demands for money, right? We know you have extra money. I need $500 for my electric bill. Um, and so they were uniquely positioned, right, both to benefit from this program, but equally importantly, to be objectified, right, as agents of the program, when in fact, they didn't have that much power structurally. So it's not that they were the sort of decision makers within their EDC corporations, um, but because of their positioning as local residents, right, as the only ones who could get in the door, as it were, um, they became the sort of face of the program for the, this is the sort of, they became the kind of access point um, for local residents to, to try to anyway, get at some of the power and privilege and money that was circulating through this program. Um, and I don't think that it's an accident that they are young women, right? I talked briefly about this kind of history of the feminization of, of labor. We see this in the industrialization moment um, in Mexico in the Maculadora program, right? This is all familiar territory. Um, but what does it mean that it's so familiar? What does it mean that the subject position rings true to us when it's supposed to be so radically different, when it's supposed to be this paradigmatic shift towards the entirely virtual, away from all these previously salient identities, right? Um, and so that was some of the work too, thinking about these multiple pasts um, and how they operate and make possible futures for people. People are earning money, right? At the time they were earning generous salaries in this sector. How were their economic futures made possible um, by pasts that had materially benefited them by the kind of economic grounding, uh, uh, sorry, educational background that I talked about, right? These positions of relative privilege, they were then able to sort of marshal to increase those hierarchies, right? So instead of sort of flattening or leveling the playing field as was ostensibly the goal, I think at one point, um, what we saw instead was a sort of deepening of these pre-existing hierarchies, um, which only, as you can imagine, fed into the frustration um, on the part of much of the local community. Thank you. I think that speaks so much to the many layers that you're able to sort of un unpeel throughout the book. Um, I have two more questions before we move to Q&A with the audience. Yeah. And one of them is about the importance of your book for Scandinavian studies. And mm -hmm. um, a section of your book is entitled Beyond a Narrative of Danes as Progressive Slaveholders. Right? Where you... <laughs> did I write that? Yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's if it's not the section that you read, it's close to the section too, you uh -huh. just read, right? Mm -hmm. And in this, in this section, you, you offer like important ratifications to this narrative and, and where you really point out, um, at least me, it seems that you were really pointing out the need to continuously trouble Scandinavian exceptionalism and white innocence. So can you speak a bit more about 
how you see your book speaking to the field of Scandinavian studies. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's an important question. Um, how to get at it. Maybe I'll back into it. Um, one thing I will say is, so the field work for this was done some time ago. You know, the, the period of intense uh, field work was 2007, 2008. A book, as, as many of you on here will know, takes much longer than that to write. Um, one of the things that happened in the intervening years was the centennial of the US um, purchase of the islands from Denmark, all right? So 2017 marked the 100, 100 year anniversary of the 1917 sale of the islands. Um, why is that important? Well, because it uh, afforded me the opportunity to connect with uh, some colleagues who would become deeply important to me, but also to travel for the first uh, meaningful time to, um, to Scandinavia. So I was able to go to Copenhagen um, for a few engagements and lectures, and that was um, deeply important to the way I wrote this book, right? Because it introduced me for the first time to really understanding the kind of myopia the kind of unwillingness to look at what felt like a closed chapter of colonial history, of slaveholding history, right? That maybe that happened, that probably happened. We don't really need to talk about that anymore. And that, and not only do we not need to talk about that, but that in no way influences our economic reality today, right? So again, past futures, where did all this money to build all this stuff come from? That's strange to me. Um, so anyway, so 2017 was a sort of turning point in thinking about we weren't having a dialogue, right? For people in the Virgin Islands are deeply engaged, as I've talked about, um, talked about even in this talk, with the history of, of colonization, right? The streets, the plantation ruins, their towns being named after sovereigns. Um, but it was a unidirectional kind of salvo. Like we were in conversation with this history. It became very clear to me um, when I got to Copenhagen that it was not, uh, the conversation was not mutual. Um, and I thought, Okay, that has to be an important part of the narrative that I'm presenting. If the history, right, if the economic history of these islands is deeply important to its present and futures, as I argue, then we have to take seriously those histories in both regards, right? Both how it matters here, how it matters in the Virgin Islands, but also how it has mattered for Denmark, right? It felt to me, and you know, many of you in the room have have um, vast degrees of experience with this uh, more than I do, but it felt to me that not only was they're not a pedagogical commitment to teaching this kind of colonial and slaveholding history. So there wasn't that commitment, but there was also a sort of deep aversion to it, right? What you talk about as this white innocence, right? So some people maybe did some things um, and I felt that that translated into the literature even, right? So because the holdings weren't as expansive as say the Spanish or the English, right? We think about um, you know, the, the British empire, surely. But because it's on a smaller scale, I don't think excuses or exceptionalizes, or ought to anyway, ought to exceptionalize um, the role of the Danes in both the slave trade and in colonial rule, right? I think it's deeply important to think about the fact that people are still living with the echoes and the inheritances, right? Again, Anne Stoller's notion of imperial debris, we're still living, taking the bus right next to those things today, right? Um, and it, it seemed to me then, and it seems to me now that that at the very least, we ought to be in dialogue with one another, right? That we're not sort of throwing these um, darts and saying, remember us, this happened and we're continuing to sort of grapple with it. Um, but it seems to me that I ought to at least contribute um, to the growing literature um, on the ways that slavery impacts our economic realities today and think about, sure, they had a much smaller empire, but what did it mean anyway, right? In the space that they did occupy, what were their practices, right? Thinking through their, um, I had to look at archival records about some of the uh, the punishments that were meted out, um, which were horrific, right? The, the, the kind of um, material realities on the transatlantic, the middle passage, right? Were those markedly different on Danish ships than they were on Spanish ships? No, right? It was horrible. People died just the same. Um, and this notion that that Danes historically have gotten a sort of hall pass, right? As, as um, lenient slave owners. I don't even know what that might mean. <laughs> um, or that, you know, their colonial ambitions weren't that extensive. So maybe they deserve, and I don't know, I, that just never sat well with me. And as I say, it was a sort of embodied experience of going to Copenhagen and feeling that, right? Feeling that sort of desired distance from this history. Um, it made clear to me that I need to, take seriously what it was like, right? If I'm an anthropologist who's thinking about the lived experience of these moments, the archive offers us, right? What was it like for, pe for enslaved um, people working on these plantations in that moment? And why is it that that's the experience that present day Virgin Islanders connect to so immediately?
right? So that Denmark had to be an important part of the story because if we're looking back to slavery, that's the moment, right? That they're returning to, that's the moment of return. Um, so what was that and why does it continue to be so resonant um, to Virgin Islanders in this moment? Yeah, and I, that just really speaks to something that you said in the beginning that was so striking that not everyone can apprehend a ghost, right? Yeah, or wants to, right? Or wants to. Yeah. <laughs> Some people don't go where the ghosts are. Exactly. Um, so my final question is about um, sovereignty. And it's, it's prompted by your analysis of how the Virgin Islands in many ways uh, remain invested in its long colonial past and in the promises of um, American empire. And, and, and you write about how you can still see the three flags in the governor's house or like the seven flags of uh, current and former colonizers in certain parts of the island. Mm -hmm. um, and so given the continuity of this investments, what kind of sovereignty do Virgin Islanders imagine for themselves? And I don't even know if this is the right way to ask this question, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. And I think it's a great question. I think it's a complicated question. Um, because as I have said, and what's crucially important to the analysis is we're talking about a space that is occupied territory, right? So like neighboring Puerto Rico, which has a much more robust and vibrant kind of um, public discourse around issues of sovereignty, right? So they have this sort of independence vote with some regularity, like there is some sort of um, sort of discourse that one might apprehend. Here in the Virgin Islands, it feels much more discreet, more diffuse, like it's hard to sort of put your finger on. Um, the one space in which these sort of political concerns were explicitly at the fore were in these constitutional conventions that I write about, right? Um, in which community members would get together and have these kinds of organized forums. But even that wasn't on its face really about a sort of tension with American imperialism. It wasn't about sovereignty writ large, right? So we want, we don't wanna be an unincorporated territory. We don't wanna be a colony anymore. We want independence. That wasn't even the purpose of these um, discourses. Rather, it was trying to sort of eke out uh, material possibilities for local residents, right? So things like protecting um, land use and protecting employment opportunities from these presumed anyway encroachers, right? These sort of interlopers from the US mainland. Um, I say that to say there isn't a sort of robust discourse around sovereignty, right? So there's not, there's no one in the back room sketching up the new flag, right? So when we overthrow the Americans, but yet there is something, right? So Yaramar Bonilla, who works in Puerto Rico, um, has done work on, on this sort of notion of complicated sovereignty, right? So maybe it's not independence, but maybe there's a sort of cultural sovereignty, economic independence, right? There certainly are areas around which Virgin Islanders are deeply, deeply concerned, right? Um, and so if we took those areas of sovereignty, the sort of graduated sovereignty seriously, right? Not just in the political realm, but what does it mean that, that Virgin Islanders are so concerned about their sort of economic futures being bound up in what's called foreign capital, right? How foreign is it when it's American money, right? So I think that we need to think through what it means today, right? There's so much conversation around the post-colonial, this neo-colonial, but we're an actual <laughs> moment of coloniality, right? Um, what sovereignty might look like if we took um, maybe Bonilla's notion of sort of graduated sovereignty or complicated sovereignty. It's not all or nothing. It's not a sort of bloody coup or rebellion or nothing, right? But it is these sort of quieter moments of, of demanding and exerting autonomy over areas of their life and saying, you can have this, but but not that, right? Because, because everyone is sort of... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Everyone has something to lose, right? So Virgin Islanders will say things like, we don't want these people coming here, but by the same token, when their island is devastated in, in 2017 by the catastrophic hurricanes Irma and Maria, as one instance, they had access to blue passports that would allow them to go to the United States mainland, right? So they had the opportunity to leave, right? So they had that kind of possibility of mobility that was foreclosed to so many in the region, right? So if you're in Dominica, if you're in St. Lucia, you don't have that possibility. So there are benefits that accrue um, to Virgin Islanders as colonial subjects. And they are very, you know, I, I, Virgin Islanders, I would say, are very um, nimble at articulating their complicated position, right? So they understand that there are benefits that accrue to them. Um, but I guess the contribution that I'm trying to make is that there are demerits as well. And it's in that space that we need to really think about what a complicated sovereignty might look like, right? 
Thank you. Um, it was really interesting for me to read your book um, and think about also Lavon Bell's work around yeah. what she often terms self-sovereignty and self-possession, and right, and really also bring that dimension in of this kind of sovereignty that can come from within. Mm -hmm. and, and it just really speaks to this sort of idea of complicated sovereignty that you're getting at. And taking those multiple registers seriously, right? So it's not just in the in the explicitly political realm that they're either sovereign or they're not, but there are multiple sort of, you know, Levon does this importantly in her work as an artist, you know, I think about it ethnographically, but people are living their lives, right? What are the areas in which they um, demand and express autonomy, right? And sovereignty. And how do we think about that in the realm of the economic um, in particular for my work, right? So thinking broadly beyond just explicitly political language. Thank you, Tammy. That was brilliant. And I, I, I think we still have plenty of issues to talk about. So I want to invite our audience <laughs> to join. And I think we already have a question from Annalisa. Annalisa, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question? Sure. And I'm trying to turn my video on as well. Um, Tammy, I just wanted to say thank you so much for writing this book, um, because I, I started working on a project on heritage development on St. Croix, so I'm, I'm a heritage scholar and I'm working on something about um, development, cultural heritage, the ordering of space, and so I was thrilled to come across your book a few months ago, um, so thank you so much, it was really insightful, it's been really useful to me, and then I do also have a question. Um, so I, I wanted to ask um, two things. One, what's the reception been of the book on the island? Do people feel that you accurately represented um, their positions or, or how have people you know, perceived it? And then secondarily, are you working on anything else related to this or do you have other projects that are coming up that we can look forward to? Thank you for those two wonderful questions. Yeah, I can actually answer the first one um, by way of a recent development. Um, so I mentioned that I, it was just last week actually, uh, for complicated reasons, I wasn't able to go before then. Um, but I went to St. Croix last week and presented the book. And I was nervous about it because, again, there's a lot of sort of treading water, right, trying to articulate these multiple positions. And I'm thrilled to say it was very well received. Um, and so I presented at the local university. And what folks there appreciated um, was the sort of way that I that I tried anyway to thread their critiques and a number of the people that had been informants were in the room, tried to thread their critiques into sort of larger, both regional and transnational objections to projects uh, and processes of racialized capitalism. Um, so it went well, no one who was an advocate of the EDC community came, um, but that's fine. And it's interesting because the person who was um, deeply important to granting me access to some of these spaces was at the time that the chairman of the the governing board, the local governing board for this program. He has since then become and has recently been reelected uh, the governor of the US Virgin Islands. So I am, I guess, maybe waiting with bated breath to hear, see if I get a phone call from him um, because he is deeply committed to this, as is, as is common, right? Um, deeply committed to this approach of neoliberal development as a sort of salvation of the economy. Um, but as I often say, there are different ways to look at it. And I think. Um, many of the people I spoke with earnestly had the improvement of the Virgin Islands at the heart of their uh, intervention, but I don't think that we often um, take enough time to think about what that means. Again, what is improvement um, and who are Virgin Islanders? So it went well, knock on wood. Um, and the new work that I have been doing, yeah, I've been thinking about what this work has uh, offered to me now in its later stages is thinking about precarity and vulnerability, right? Um, so it became clearly clear. It became clear to me that coloniality is is a central part of this story that I that I've told in the book. Um, but what has happened in the years since? Things like the hurricanes, right, and climate change, which continue to demonstrate, and COVID, um, the inability of places like the Virgin Islands to do things like protect its borders, right, its geographical borders. Um, to think about the kind of care work that is demanded um, of Black women, again, in moments like COVID-19, right, the kind of affective labor um, to which these women find them subject without much choice, really, that looks a lot like um, previous moments in history. All this has me thinking about precarity and vulnerability, again, outside of an explicitly political register, but what does it mean to be vulnerable? Um, and how do we, how are these moments of environmental, public health, how, sort of geopolitical, how are these moments of precarity maybe interconnected? And why is it that their weight so often falls disproportionately on the same shoulders, right? From generation to generation. So maybe I'm veering slightly into the, into the literary, but I do wanna think about precarity as a kind of um, flashpoint 
and how do we think about black bodies um, over time and across space. But thank you, I'm excited to hear about your heritage development work. That's great. Thank you, Annalisa and Tammy for the answer. Any other questions from your our esteemed audience members? <laughs> I have a question. Oh, um, you know, I was just thinking of this lovely term, hauntology. I, let me start my stuff. Thank you so much for the great talk. I just found myself really enjoying it, and 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 and, and uh, I'm I'm just so grateful for this uh, this discussion, sort of under the rubric of of SAS. It's just uh, really inspiring to have such energetic, you know challenging thoughtful work going on that they can be a part of this society as well i know that you're you're sort of not necessarily in sas as an anthropologist but i certainly hope that you can bring this conversation more to to our society and um it's just great to be a part of it so thank you so much daniela and um tammy for for, for this 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 morning um I'll, I'll i guess the question i had was i was the hauntology to me means gary Dawes book specters of marx um and you know, I, thinking back about that book, as I recall, he sort of, uh, it's about, you know, he, I think it came out in 1993 and it was, a, you know, after the fall of communism. And so like, what next for, uh, you know, revolutionary politics, uh, I guess, to sort of in the European context. And he sort of, I, as I recall, it, it, there, there's, it's, there's a lot of points that he makes, but it, it, my recollection is it's the sort of the spirit of critique that Marx leaves us with in, in his, his view. And so, and that, I guess that spirit of critique is about, you know, we can't hope for some kind of liberation from revolution, but we have to just kind of do the daily work. And that's, that, that's I guess, about time and looking to the future and, and wondering what, what, what comes next. What does this all lead to? And that was the thing I was sort of wondering about your informants. What are they, what are they hope for? What are they working toward? If, it, if, if it's not some sort of revolutionary transformation, you know, is it, <laughs> it sounds like they're very skeptical of like supply side, you know, enrichment but i just wondered like what do they say about what are they hoping for yeah thank you i think um you know annalisa maybe will have something to say about that when we look at heritage tourism but i you know i think what virgin Islanders, i get this question a lot i should say right so you're positioning uh the sort of neoliberal development this long history of failed projects what's the answer right to which i always offer i don't know and i don't know that virgin Islanders know what what the next thing is but i do know that it's if we are not in deep conversation and taking these sort of alternate frameworks seriously, we're just going to make the same mistakes that we have historically made, which continues to happen, by the way. So I'll give you an example. Um, so the ADC has been in steep decline in the years since I did this research. As I say, it was 07, 08. Um, that's the year that the American um, economy experienced what has alternately been called a crash or um, an extreme contraction. Right. But a lot of the money that was funding this program was American capital, right? This foreign capital was US based. Um, it dried up, right? So many of these people were either indicted or lost all their money. Um, and so the EDC pro program today is not operating at anything near like the scale it was um, in the mid 2000s. I and mean, what has happened in its place was a recommitment to a longstanding um, attempt at economic development through natural resources. So there's an oil refining plant um, known as the Hovenza Oil Refinery. Um, on St. Croix. And so the thought was, okay, the EDC money is drying up. Let's try to reinvigorate the oil refinery plant, right? Which has had incredibly deleterious um, environmental and health effects. Um, there are uh, um, class action lawsuits. The EPA is involved, right? There has been all kinds of um, evidence demonstrating the negative effects of this program. Why am I telling you this story? Um, I'm telling you this story because it seems to me that in our rush to think about, okay, this has failed, what's next? We don't take seriously why it failed, right? We don't take, in our, in our rush to figure out what the next thing is, okay, so it's not neoliberal development, how are we going to get money in here? It seems to me that that's a sort of individual isolated approach rather than apprehending the structural continuities, right? And perhaps if we start from theorizing from the position of the most vulnerable, Again, why is it that these negative effects environmentally in public health, in affect, fall on the shoulders of black people, right? If we start from that position, maybe theorizing from the position of the most vulnerable, we might be able to imagine, and this is a this is a thought exercise, we might be able to imagine a future in which that's not the case, right? That it's a sort of inversion of the question, not what comes next, but what have we been doing, right? In multiple registers for all these generations and centuries, who are the people that have disproportionately shouldered the burden? Okay, we can easily identify that. What is a future 
And this isn't anthropological, this isn't literary, this isn't social science. What is a future that we might imagine that doesn't rely on the labor, on the dispossession, on the displacement, on the murder, um, on the slow death of these same people, right? That's, and I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if any of us do, but I constantly return to an insistence on starting from the position of precarity of the most vulnerable, of the people that shoulder these burdens disproportionately to then go on and do that work of imagining a future. I, I can't imagine doing it. You know, it seems this is my objection to linearity. Of course, this has failed. What's next? Like, let's fix it, right? But in that rush to fix it and do the next thing, I don't think that that allows us the time and space necessary to think about how do we address the fundamental structures um, that have continued to reappear over time, right? Such that whatever the new wonderful thing we create won't again be apprehended as slavery or racialized capitalism. So it's not, a, it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy answer, but I think it's the answer I, ins I insist upon because we've tried different things. So the whole Venza thing was supposed to fix all this, right? And again, in a different way, it has been catastrophic. Thank, thanks so much for that answer. I just, it was very uh, interesting too, to hear the way that it helped explain the logical connection to the next project. So yeah, really, really interesting answer. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? It seems to be a busy time of afternoon on the, on the Denmark side. <laughs> yes, it's dinner time. Oh, wow. On this, on this side. But Lilian has a question, I know, yes. Hi. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Although, so thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy that this is happening and thank you everybody for making this happen. And yeah, and thank you Tami for such an immensely important book. And first thing, I will definitely include the chapter on the progressive slave owners in my syllabi. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your wonderful and excellent questions, um, um, Daniela. Um, so I have a question. Now you've talked a little bit about, you know, the, this notion of spectral time <laughs> or, or times. And I was thinking if this could also be translated into spectral spaces. You know, you mentioned the... Um, you mentioned the estate names. I mean, that is something that struck me, you know, when just arriving in, in St. Croix and you get a, you know, this these tourist maps of St. Croix and and that these units still exist to the very day. And I did at some point research on this, you know, the Norwegian judge Engebret Hesselberg, who was um, this very important figure in, you know, quelling, um, a, a planned uprising uh, on St. Croix, I think uh, in the mid 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he's such an infamous figure, very much uh, on, unknown in, in Norway. Mm. Um, but um, so I just. And we have Hassel, Hasselback Island. This, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and, no, and it, there's uh, because I, I just did some research that he had an estate as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. called after him and it's it it's now a neighborhood in Fredericks in Frederickstead. I drove through it, you know. So this is so much so so I'm just I, I would be curious to know, you know, how this continuity of you know the you know um the colonial past translating into the present and the future, if this also translates into, you know, with this like spatial configurations of, of the islands, what you yeah, would say about. Think, and also what what also struck me is of course and what what still troubles me is you know the ruins of sugar mills uh like everybody that that dominate the the visual space of um especially saint croix and and how they are changing and turned into something else but probably the very same thing is true that yeah. <laughs> you know that as soon as, as long as land ownership or ownership you know, structures uh, don't change. <laughs> so then be... uh, they they change. Uh, sp I don't know significance or they change whatever, but but not really. So I'd be curious to. But to not really. What... No, exactly. But... I think that that's the most important intervention. Not not really, right? So and that's why I took pains in the book and in this excerpt to say, you know, in these sugar mills where entire limbs could be lost, because there's a sort of way in which we can romanticize the past. Like, look at these beautiful, these were agent, uh, sort of spaces of, of um, capitalist development, torture, right? Death, 
people were maimed. Um, and so I think it's really important that we connect them to their both economic history and colonial history, right? And don't let them be sort of absented out as sort of just these ruins, these remains of this long ago time. Um, again, I haven't theorized this, but as, as Danielle and I have been talking about in the talk, LaVon Bell has talked about the importance of the built environment and space in psych in the psychic register, right? So that you're going through and past. One of the things I was gonna read, it's on the very next page of the excerpt that I just read from, um, is I was doing work in Christianstead, right? Um, and it was in the mid 2000s and they were, they were doing some sort of digging at the, at the fort at King Christian. They were looking for something um, and accidentally they unearthed a whipping post, right? It was in the middle of Christianstead, right? Sort of busy, bustling, shopping um, day. They, they accidentally dug up a whipping post, right? So when you, in front of the Danish fort in Christianstead. So when you think about the distance between the past and the present, it's not that far, right? Um, and when you have to walk through these ruins, you talked about sugar mills, but there are all kinds of other horrific, I mean, absolutely horrific remnants, right? Of the plantation system, not just the carving up of, of the island into things like these neighborhoods, you've talked about Hasselbeck, but all these plantations, but also who continues to benefit, right? The descendants of the plantocracy, there are still families um, that sort of have connections to the plantocracy that continue to materially benefit um, from living and working in the territory. So all of that to say is, I haven't worked on this ethnographically, but you know, LaVon Bell is one person who's taken it very seriously. And I think it's important, not just in the, in the register of the sort of landscape, but in this psychic, right? What does it take to sort of disconnect, to turn your mind off and say, well, that's a pretty structure um, and understand, right? And be able to fully apprehend its violence um, and the tool that it was, but to sort of absent all that um, and make it a sort of neutral, just sort of landmark that dots the landscape, particularly on St. Croix, where there's just so much more space, right? So if you're not as familiar with the U.S. Virgin Islands, the, the three main islands, St. Croix by far is the largest and the, 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 the topography is such that um, it has the most arable land. So the other two islands, if you've been there, are extremely hilly, St. John being perhaps the sort of most difficult to maneuver of, of the three, right? So there was just much, much less plantable soil. Um, there were plantations on all three islands. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but there were just many more. It was a, of a, a, a much larger scale um, on St. Croix. So you do continue to see these remnants, the town names, the street names, um, but, you know, I think, Lilan, one of the things that is important to think about is the unidirectional nature, what, what I was talking about, of that, I don't want to call it a conversation, of those salvos, like, this is what we're living, this is what we're passing every day, and then to go to the place, right, from which they came and say, oh, that, that is the same as here, isn't that amazing, and have a kind of, not even a misrecognition, but a kind of myopia, like, we don't want to engage with that, I never learned about that, that's not important. Um, I think when we're thinking about the psychic cost of all of this, that's part of it too, right? As I say, going to Denmark in 2017 was transformative, right? And realizing, oh, this this isn't a converse, this isn't a dialogue at all. Yeah. Thank you. That was a really useful question. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we're nearing the end of our time and we need to give our guests time for their lunches and dinners <laughs> and and, bre and breakfasts and <laughs> <laughs> wherever you are thank you but perhaps i can just add to that that um you know it's i mean even even here it's even more so that these street names and so forth are used as selling points for mm -hmm. in the, the tourism discourse mm -hmm. so which even adds another dimension here yeah so you, you know in terms of the heritage of, in terms of heritage tourism or no um yeah but but general so so because i've 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 done a little bit of research into what what i term like ex-colony tourism mm -hmm. where it's you know paradise beaches and then also exciting danish history or rich Danish history and yeah. there it's you know and it's it's the same on the former swedish um colony san Bartelmi. Mm -hmm. um, where the street signs were put up again by a Swedish association in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. Yo, so so it it's even more, it's it's a missing recognition of the violence, but it's kind of adding to it or amplifying uh, yeah. by and when you as reoccupy, I do. like symbolically reoccupying the territory. But 
but not just symbolically, economically as well, right? So, and, and when I, as an economic anthropologist, why are you doing this? There's money to be made, right? It was curious to me some years ago before the pandemic began that there were these direct flights from Copenhagen to St. Croix. That's strange, right? But that, that's because it stands to reason that someone's making money from those flights, right? And it's being marketed in a particular way. So I'm saying, I'm saying heritage in a kind of scare quotes, but right, do you rediscover your long last whatever, right? These forgotten islands, right? Which are forgotten on one side of the equation, but um, it's impossible forget on, to forget on the other side. But there's the whole point I'm trying to make is this is all part of an economic history and story, right? Certainly there's psychic and material occupation, but there's also wealth. Um, accumulation, right? The tourism is a big business. And if you can tap into this market and this desire to reoccupy in particular ways, um, it can be lucrative, right? Thank you. And just to add to that, I think it's also interesting, the, the counter side of that is that whenever we in Denmark or Sweden for that matter try to inscribe that history in our soil, right? Then those attempts are highly contested as we could see with um, the statue of Queen Mary that Lavon and Jeanne Ehlers uh, put mm -hmm. together, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, interventions in monuments. Whatever. I was gonna say, so many, so many of the things that happened around the centennial felt fraught in a way that, not that was surprising to me, but I think that we're telling, right? So that sculpture that you talk about, it's reception, the critical reception, I think, um, is important to understand. And I think it's demonstrative of that kind of unidirectional, we are aware of you, <laughs> we're deeply aware. And this is a history that should be important to you because you are residing in the sort of, um, you have inherited the wealth of this moment, right? So it's not a past that is fully past, right? This wealth came from somewhere and we continue to occupy that space, but the lack of a sort of engagement with it, I think is deeply, um, it's complicated. It's also deeply painful. I think that also speaks to the importance of trying to break that unidirectionality and really the importance of your book to really. But that's why I appreciate these conversations. And, you know, I present this book widely, but even speaking to an audience like SAS, I, I appreciate so much, you know, the invitation, Andrew and Kimberly and Daniela, because I think, you know, having the ability to have these conversations about, yes, a long ago time, but the way it continues to impact our lives today and the way it continues to impact life on the other side as well, right? On this, in Scandinavia, I think is important. It's important that we both have a sort of inheritance from this, what do, what do you all call it? The engagement <laughs> from this sort of moment of slaveholding um, and colonialism. And I think it's important that we talk to one another across space. Okay, I think on that note, um, we could uh, come to an end. I don't, don't know if Andrew wants to say a few words. Well, I just will uh, reiterate the thanks that have been uh, 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 already stated, but this was a, just a, a, a fabulous uh, discussion. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, uh, Daniela, for just these, for the book. I look forward to, I've not read it, but but I am inspired to read it. And um, uh, thank you, Daniela, for the excellent questions and, and for all who attended. And um, we look forward to further discussion and hopefully those who um, uh, weren't aware of the uh, meeting in Austin, Texas this spring. Uh, take a look at the call for papers and I hope that there'll be an opportunity for you to think about submitting a paper or submitting a constituted, pre-constituted panel or and uh, participating in the meeting. So we look forward very much. And thank you, D Tammy. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, have a great rest of the day, evening, wherever you find yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you.